Well, good evening, everybody. Anthony Russell here from Banners on the Wall, and the headphones are on for me, me, which means I'm doing another interview, and this is the best way everything works in my household. However, a very, very special interview with a couple of people who I think I'm really interested to let you all get to see, but they don't do this very often, so we are very, very privileged at the moment to be joined on the line by Ken Riddell and Alan Batchelor of England Ice Hockey. These two gentlemen are the head of the National Ice Hockey League DOPS infrastructure. Gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me this evening. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you for letting us talk. The first thing we kind of need to do is you are, as I've joking, we, uh, we did have a, a conversation a little while ago about doing this. And as I've joked, you are stepping out into the light. Um, we will. Uh, so we'll get you guys to just give a little bit of an introduction as to your backstory in hockey and how you've ended up kind of do, doing this role. Uh, if we if we start with Ken, I'd be appreciated. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, I played a little bit of uh, junior hockey in Scotland, very, uh, and then they shut my rink down, which was Falkirk, if anyone remembers that. Um, and then I didn't do anything until I moved to Cardiff, and uh, the ice rink opened at Cardiff, and I got back into it there. Played a bit badly in Division Two. For a couple of seasons and then moved into refereeing and uh, from then on it was it's pretty much that it's been refereeing it's been supervising uh, chief referee briefly for a couple of years um and uh, yeah, that that's about it really uh, i had retired and uh, i was lost for a for a, after a while i was beginning to get itchy feet for hockey i get you just never leaves you it, it just doesn't you've got to be involved somehow and um so I, I just asked if anyone could use me for anything in particular, and the the Dobbs thing came up, and uh, so that's why I'm here. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Ken. Alan, let's let's hear about your backstory. Uh, similar to Ken, uh, mid eighty, early eighties, um, reintroduced reintroduced to uh, ice hockey. Uh, my dad, Vic Batchelder, ice hockey news review. Uh, we first went to an ice hockey game way back when, when I was a youngster in the early 70s down into London. Uh, my dad was always a fan of ice hockey for many years. Uh, I played a very small amount, I suppose recreational best. Uh, I did organise training sessions for local referees back in the day at the old Nottingham Ice Stadium. Uh, so everything I've done is to ice hockey refereeing wise. Uh, been on the ice many years, represented uh, Great Britain abroad by IHF, same as Ken has. Uh, and then obviously when I finished on there due to ill health, um, I then got involved in the background, which was training and development of officials, uh, assistant chief referee to his royal highness, Mr. Vidal. Um, <laughs> and then <clears throat> took a step back completely. Uh, and then got roped back into being involved into DOPS to uh, bring my expertise to the uh, table um, and which I, I must admit uh, I wasn't sure I'd enjoy it uh, but I must admit I have enjoyed it it's a bit like refereeing we're going to make decisions people don't like um, but obviously they're, they're done for the right reasons or the reasons that we feel uh, are the right reasons thank you and we'll certainly get into get into some of the, the hows and the whys and maybe even a little bit of the process without sort of dropping too many names into it. But just given the the date that we're recording this, uh, to pull back the curtain for our viewers, it's currently Tuesday the 17th of September. And this past weekend, I was in Gosport, many people in rinks around the country uh, uh, celebrating, giving thanks for the life of former uh, EIHA chairman and man who seems to have had his finger in so many British hockey pies, he's, uh, he, had, he would have had sticky fingers, uh, Ken Taggart, who we sadly lost uh, last week. Um, it feels it feels like two men who, who worked with him in the past in a variety of different ways. Ken, was, Ken, for a lot of people, will be this kind of name that they might have heard or a gentleman that they kind of saw uh, in a blazer at Coventry Finals weekend. <laughs> you two, tell us about Ken Taggart, the man. Force of nature, I think, is the best way to describe him. Uh, he was really, really passionate about hockey. Um, he had um, he had a, a good knack of being very human about it all. Very driven, very driven, and a hard taskmaster. But he was he, he really um, he had a real humanity about him, which is something that's sorely missed. Really, I mean, everybody in hockey that ever had any contact with Ken Taggart has a story about him, 
and some of them are ridiculous and some of them are just amazing acts of generosity uh that, that it just surprised i'll give you an example i was doing a double header i had a game in milton Keynes, and then my, on the sunday night i was down at peterborough and what i decided to do was drive up to milton Keynes, do the game see if i could grab a holiday in or something like that or a or a whatever a, you know a, some a cheap hotel somewhere and then nip over to uh, peterborough the following day and do the game over there and then drive home to cardiff um so i got to the rink and ken was there he was a rink manager i think at the time if i'm is that right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah he's the rink manager at milton Keynes at the time and he came into his room all he he gave me a, a supervision <laughs> which you can't stop him you know it's just <laughs> He just comes in and then boof, it's Ken, he's doing his thing. And it's very helpful. You know, it really was very helpful. Tinged with a fair bit of criticism, but also a fair bit of humour and praise where it was needed. So that I, I came out of there feeling okay about it with a couple of little tips. And he said, where are you off to now? He said, do you want to come for a pint? And I said, uh, well, no, I'm going to be driving around. I'm going to get a, a hotel to stay in the night. He said, oh, he said, have my house keys. He gave me his address. He'd only, he'd only reason, he only knew me vaguely. But he handed his house keys over to me and said, I'm going into London tonight with some of the boys. Um, had my keys um, and uh, stay in the house. So he said, it's fine. You can stay there. Stay there overnight. There's some stuff in the fridge. Um, don't touch the Jack Daniels. Um, and uh, please, the only thing I ask you is two things. First of all, don't burn the house down. And I said, OK, I won't do that. I promise. And he said, and then just stick the keys back through the letterbox when you leave. I, 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 he had no, he'd met, we'd met maybe twice and he handed his house over to me with his keys and all his stuff was in there. So I've got to be fair to him, he was spot on. But there was other things as well, you know, uh, uh, even beyond the hockey side. Oh, well, going back to hockey, <laughs> I was playing and we were playing at Milton Keynes uh, one late night and uh, Ken was there and he said, oh, I'm going to referee tonight. So I said, oh, that's, that's great, Ken. Be good to see you on the ice. And... <laughs> We, we all lined up. We got the starting lineups out there. I was standing there in the centre ice with my little stick, <laughs> waiting for Ken. And I thought, where the bloody hell is he? Nobody could, nobody knew where he'd got to. He was on the ice, and then he wasn't. So we thought, well, where's he gone? And I had to look over, and he was sitting in the penalty box, smoking a cheroot. So I said, come on, Ken, we're ready to go here. Everybody's ready. And he said, I'm not moving till I finish this. And we all went, all right, OK. So <laughs> another warm-up, everybody, another warm-up. Yeah, it was that sort of stuff. It was just force of nature. Really miss, really miss him. I think one of the fond memories I have of Ken, uh, which is going back many years, <clears throat> was when he was. Uh, I, I, I was. I was regaling the story to somebody else recently. I can't remember whether he was playing for Panthers because I know he did briefly, but I know he was also with Bristol when he was in the Air Force days, mm -hmm. and he used to turn up in the car park in Nottingham and uh sell his contraband because <laughs> he'd open his boot up yes. and it might be labats this or uh budweiser that and it was yeah. like what do you fancy having this week um yeah. but i think with, with ken um somebody else described him as a bit like marmite you either liked him or you didn't um i've always got we always got on very well yeah. uh when he was uh dealing with uh the referees as such and when um you know looking after people's best interests whilst they may not always agree he did it with primarily for the right reasons um which some people would get behind and some people wouldn't um he was very progressive at the time in looking after the lesser known roles like female referees women's hockey etc he, he managed to put uh, things together which started the whole process process of uh, introduction for women's uh, within the sport as as a whole in a way. Um, but obviously, you would always if you ever did a game with him, lots of funny quips to players, which would always make you smile and chuckle about. You know, you can't repeat on on a podcast. No, you could not in a family podcast like this. No. <laughs> it was also even when we used to go to some of the AGMs and the meetings, etc. It was all done with uh, humanity. He was very polite to everybody. He made his presence or feelings known as well, which sometimes did rub people up the wrong way because sometimes he might be a little bit uh, brash with it. But that was, that was Ken. Yep. Yeah.
and everybody sort of respected him for it there are some characters within the sport still that when you speak to them you take them at face value because that's the way they are that's the way they come across take me as i am yeah. um and i put myself and ken in that same light in a way what you see is what you get we try to be upfront and honest when you're a referee out in the middle of the ice we make mistakes but then you get 1500 i was fortunate enough to have thirteen thousand people look at me thinking you're a complete idiot but i was enjoying myself <laughs> um the decisions i made I, I you know i still stand by still stand by and you know it's the same as what we're doing now you know whatever we're putting our minds to we're trying to do it for the right reasons well let's turn then to to your current roles as it were and we uh wherever ken is watching us may the may the jd and coke be uh be cold sir enjoy yourself yeah. wherever you may be. Yeah. um but, but obviously uh obviously the department of player safety for the for the national ice hockey league quite a new invention last year and in our in our sort of pre in our pre-meet that we did about this i said that and i still maintain this so off the back of last year the Department of Player Safety has something of a credibility gap that it needs to fill from last year. How have we got to the point that we have now? Because obviously, DOPS, it would be unfair to DOPS to say it did absolutely everything wrong, but it definitely made a few situations, it definitely created a few situations last year that people definitely did not agree with. There were some things right at the very beginning, the Darcy Flanagan situation, for example, that caused people to lose faith in the system relatively quickly, certainly from a fan perspective as a stakeholder what happened last year and how can we how are we what are we looking at now to kind of make things better go on Ken. Go. all you right i'll go i'll go um well <clears throat> last season um we came in we were, we saw the dops document last early last summer that would uh, sorry summer before last which was going to oh no it wasn't it was last summer which was going to um be the the document the bible for the rest of the season um it had in a, a number of uh anomalies that we identified both alan and i independently uh spotted straight away that, 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 that this was going to cause us a problem the main one being that there was a minimum tariff all the way through for for particular um penalties I'll give an example. A check to the head would get you a minimum of six games, no matter what that check to the head was. So there was no flexibility anywhere at all. And at the time, I was quite vocal about uh, saying that this is going to cause all sorts of issues. Um, and it did. And it didn't surprise us. I think. Um, the, 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 oh, Alan, the, sorry, mate. That's all right. Um, it's, you never know when to jump in or what. You just go ahead and jump in anytime. It took a, took a pause to breathe, and I thought, I'll oh, jump in now. <laughs> I think the other thing that made things worse was the fact that the match penalty was removed. Yes. So we suddenly had, we were dealing with an increase in five and in games, which were now like the maximum penalty that can be called. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously, with the way the process has been set up, which whilst we had a small input, um, we made comments, suggestions, the people that were looking after it, that were in charge, um, made their decisions in the same way that all the people will make decisions. You go along with it. Um, you put your point across, but you respect what they want to do. Um, so we got on with the task at hand. Um, ultimately realizing that yes it was not going to be popular because our opinion was this um, and obviously throughout the course of last season there were incidents that were thrown up that if you have a, a good understanding of phrases and terms that are used within the sport that would you know it was a clumsy hit a lot of people will understand that because it was possibly unintentional but um but the way the tariff system was set up that wouldn't take that into account it's this because okay that's what he's going to get he's going to get a six game ban um so obviously whilst we were dealing with the directive and do, doing the best with what we had to hand um <clears throat> we decided that Sort of moving it along not wishing to dwell on it too much 
when me and Ken then got put in charge as an interim, um, we the first decision that we had to make, which was obviously quite challenging from our point of view, was do we stick with it or do we change it? Uh, and we were both very similar because we are very similar in the way in which we conduct ourselves and you know think in the sense of, well, as ex-referees, the worst thing you can do is change your game plan halfway through a game because it'll only cause confusion, upset people, and the players won't understand. So mutually, we sat down at a twin bag and thought, I think it's best if we stick as, as we are and carry on. Didn't we, Ken? We did. And we, we started at that point to review what we were doing. Um, because we've been running with it for a few months of the season, it was, what, November, late November or something, we, right. we were right. approached by the board to and asked if we would take interim charge of it until they found somebody to take over the Department of Player Safety. So um, there was... Uh, there was a lot of confusion, even in amongst the ranks of uh, DOPS, that we were kind of, it was the changeover was so sudden that we didn't have access to what had happened before. We had absolutely no idea what had been said to anyone about anything. Um, so uh, we just had to stick with what we had in black and white, and that's what we did for the until the end of the season. We agreed this with the board at the time that, look, we'll review all this as we go along. And we'll, we've got a car park where we, any ideas that uh, pop up during, the, during the, the workings of all of this, that we can put these things and then look at them in the quiet of the closed season and then um, make, make judgments at that point about what we're going to do. Because we both recognised, well, we both recognised before the season started last season that this is going to be a bit of a shit show, um, and it turned out to be. Um, and when we were in the middle of it by the end of November, and once we saw what the mess was, we thought, right, okay, it's bad just now. If we start changing things, there's going to be utter chaos. So we'll just run with what we've got because people are by now they're used to it. So we'll. <laughs> We'll just leave it as it is until the end of the season and work from there. And that's what we did. So we had a whole host of uh, things we had to look at <coughs> that we knew we had to do um, in the summer. And that's what we've been doing since since the end of the season. I suppose the issue for, for some bits and pieces last season, and I'm not suggesting that you took the tariff documents and completely ripped everything up. As you said, you kind of, there are, everybody was kind of used to it. Well, at that point, you guys sort of came in in November. Yeah. But certainly the application of how some of those how some of those bits and pieces were done, there was an argument there that they could have really been changed. I mean, there were, you know, uh, I think of the of the incident, and I'll single him out because it's the one that I think of, the incident of Josh Martin being banned for quite a substantial amount of games in the middle of last season to have it dropped down. You no know, announcement came out. And I think there's, I, I, like I said, I think the, I, I think people can understand and appreciate why, the mo why the mo of how of what was going to happen didn't change but certainly i think one of the things and it's been a long-standing criticism myself of uh, of of, the, of england ice hockey the iha beforehand and i think a lot of people make about british hockey in general the quality of communication that comes out from bits and pieces sometimes leaves a lot to be desired mm -hmm. and given the fact this was impacting players being able to play it seemed at times and i certainly had club I had players, coaches, owners at times saying to me, we have no idea what's going on. That's There's an argument there that that's, some, that's something that could have been altered quite quickly during last season. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. I think at the time when we were asked to take over, uh, we just turned around and said, yes, we'll take over, uh, but we're not going to be front and centre. We don't want to be known that we're doing it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because we don't know how long we're going to be doing it, uh, so we didn't want to be exposed. They were happy with that. Uh, they were also happy to carry on in the same vein. Um, I don't disagree about in terms of the communication side. That mm -hmm, could have been absolutely. improved. Um, however, I'll be honest, uh, I have a day job. I have health issues to manage, uh, which compromise me, which Ken knows more about, which I'm not wishing to go into those everyone that knows me basically knows my issues up to a point um so in terms of a work-life balance uh, there's only so much time i can or then was able to dedicate to uh, and because it was pretty much of a 
um, I'll like, remove a certain word and say shambles in some ways. <laughs> um, we were also at a disadvantage in terms of um, the background within the organisation as a whole, where, for an example, you'll go to some clubs and they'll have a very good setup, uh, a very slick machine from the PR to how everything runs on game day, and you'll go to another venue and it's the total opposite. Um, we were sort of in that. Uh, could we have done more stuff to be more proactive, Ken? I think maybe we could have done. Yeah, yeah. Could have done, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, but I think you've got to, uh, um, um, Anthony, the um, issue with a player, but let's say Josh Martin um, at the time and his big penalty that he got and then it was reduced. Um, the reduction in the penalty has absolutely nothing to do with DOPS. Um, it's That's part of the remit of the um, appeals team, which is completely separate from DOPS. We don't have any input into that. The, sorry, I tell a lie. We do have a small input into it. What we do is we supply the um, raison d'etre as to why that penalty would be called at that level. And then and we supply them with the video and we supply them with the match reports from the officials. Um, and that's it. We just hand over the paperwork, in other words, uh, about a particular case. And then we leave it entirely up to the um, appeals committee. And it's it's for them really to to communicate that stuff it's not for us to say anything about it because we don't we deliberately don't want to be involved in appeals it's a bit like being the judge and the jury if you know what i mean well yes i, th I think there's, it, the useful thing is to hear hear that be said i think yes. as well because i think one of the things that confuses people and, and i should be i should say uh for for folk who can't see because the joy of Google Meets is that it swaps between the speaker. I keep flicking to my phone, which has got the DOPS document open on it um, <laughs> at the moment, oh, right. in bits and pieces. But the, um, I think it's very, very useful because I think probably one of the biggest things for for fans, like I say, for fans and outsiders as a stakeholder, because it's only my understanding is the two of you were at, were at the league meetings across the summer. Um, yes. From my from from having spoken to people within within the organisation and also having spoken to coaches as well what was what was delivered to them was relatively well received i think there's that the issue of course is that the the fan voice is probably the loudest voice sometimes even and the issue being that it's not a, it's not always the best informed because the information for whatever reason doesn't always quite make it out especially some stuff that probably should so i, mm -hmm. I do thank you for kind of clarifying on that point where the where the appeals go um the thing that occurs to me, of course, is, and this is just off the back of, uh, of last weekend, the National Division, of course, now has its own separate sort of game review panel that is part of the DOPS infrastructure, but is specific only to the National Division. Dave yeah. Cloutman, Matt Thompson, two very, very experienced referees, and I, uh, 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 the amount of stories between the two of them, they could probably throw up about Ken Taggart and some other bits and pieces yes. to probably <laughs> fill another show. So we will leave that to one side. But... For people, because certainly one of the things I got speaking to fans, particularly of Division One sides, it should be said, it's like, well, the national division seems to be getting all the extra goodies on top. Where is it for us? Now, my understanding is that the national division are, fun are self-funding this yeah. game, this extra game panel. Can I just interject there, Anthony? Of course. So, so all I would say is, so the national or planet ice i'm not sure how to rephrase it or is it the p i n i h l we call it the national division here alan because they don't pay me for the sponsorship so we good good, good. Uh, so, <laughs> so everything that's been put in place at this present moment in time is being funded by the teams i don't think i'm speaking out of turn and hopefully the nobody will wish to take it against me at a later date so because the teams have put stumping up the money extra things can be put into place uh, so in terms of the uh, game review panel that is something that was set up by the national league to liaise with dops so we need everyone to understand that it's not part of dops it is liaising with dops so it's like a middle ground because one of the concerns which again we all want the fans to enjoy themselves when they go to a game so they want players on the ice so one of the discussions that were quite critical during the summer was how can we facilitate that now obviously our our viewpoint is player safety um and obviously 
<clears throat> anyone that reads a rule book may now may not be many of us out there that do over the last 20 25 years it's changed quite drastically as the terminology that use and what they want to eradicate from the sport so one of the challenges we have at the moment which we we, we were discussing during the summer was the offenses that were on the increase on the statistics that we had from last season the issue regarding uh, fighting and how that's uh, changed in the IHF rule book and the owners and coaches of the national wanting to be able to have the best product that they can put out on any given day so we were we're hoping that having the liaison with the game review panel will assist with their experience and knowledge of the game those penalties and infractions that were probably deemed as it doesn't need to go any further than the penalty that was assessed on the day is adequate enough which is why on the majority of penalties this coming this season do not have a mandatory suspension tied to them so especially for the national league the, they get reviewed and then basically it's a simple yes you can play no further action and then oh you can't play it's going to dots and they send the information over to dots to tell us heads up you've got one coming your way and then the the lead for that level will then deal with it anything you want to add ken no i think that's pretty much covers uh, what's happened i mean we um uh, part of the um part of the the changes that we've made during the summer is that we've taken out the the mandatory one game from virtually everything um so that doesn't doesn't um doesn't happen anymore in the leagues except in very specific circumstances and um what was the other thing that we say oh yeah i said we've gone up to there's no there's no mandatory um number that you have to go to when you call a uh if there's a uh, in the tariffs each tariff is set at a separate set at a certain level so you've got a number of games in every tariff but we are going up to that so you the the people who are working with us now can go from one game to whatever the highest point in that tariff is concerned so it's, it gives the the people in dops a much more flexible um um decision making process approach they can they can have a flexible approach to how the the uh the the offense is, uh, is dealt with so but as, also so we, we check earlier, every sorry so as we were talking about earlier this idea that there is a difference between in an intent to injure on a hit and a clumsy hit and and therefore exactly. this new system should hopefully give give uh, the, uh give dops that little bit of a added flexibility to assess things in a different way are, mm -hmm. um, are repeat offenders going to be dealt with, uh, dealt yes. with in a particular way? Because thank you, yeah. Because obviously the elite league, when they with the elite league department of player safety, it's always one of the things that's mentioned as to whether a person is a repeat offender. So it, repeat offences will be will be taken into account. Yeah, we track everything. Everything <coughs> gets um, we we have a, a point penalty, penalty points tracker that we use, um, and that gives us an up to date version of of where each player stands. That's offend that's uh, been uh, given some penalty points. We can see what they've been doing. In other words, um, last season we, it was a bit difficult to keep track of things because there were there were there was one or two players who were repeat offenders. Um, there's no two ways about it. But uh, this season it's there. It's in the DOPS manual. Um, uh, repeat offenders will be looked at so we'll be looking at the players especially in the the big three effectively the check to the head check to the head and neck the checking from behind and the boarding we'll be looking at that very closely and we'll be looking at fighting as well very closely as well um if people if we see people doing the same thing over and over again they're obviously not learning their lesson um but it's not going to be a, a hammer to crack a nut on this one we work in alan and i've got a really good relationship with other departments within EIH. We've done that over the last year, last uh, 10 months or so. Um, we've been talking to the junior section, the women's section, um, the coaches, uh, the National League as well. Um, uh, and we would be going, if we see repeat offenders, we'd be talking to the coaches and we'll be asking the coaches, what's the problem? What is it you need from us in order to help you to stop your players from doing this stuff? Is it, do you need some more coaching advice or what is it you need? So that's that's a general principle that we're working to this season. 
rather than just because it obviously didn't work last season. Uh, uh, hammering people to the floor, nailing them to the floor doesn't always work. So we, we're taking a slightly different uh, approach to that. We'll, we'll, um, we'll call the penalties as they are. We'll, we'll, we'll issue the, the, um, <clears throat> the suspensions as, as the, the, um, the rules and regulations, the docs rules and regula regulations say, but we'll also be looking at who's doing what and does that, does that player need some a word in his ear from his coach rather than us banning him? I'd rather I'd rather take that approach than automatically saying this is the number of times you're allowed to do something before we uh, before we throw you out for a few games. I think so the, one thing we can, the one thing we can add to that is with the refereeing background we've got um, a lot of the time as a referee on the ice, game management comes into play. Yep. So one of the things that we've been very proactive with during the summer is opening communication channels so that we can try to ensure that if there seems to be a problem arising at a venue, and now I say venue because some rinks will have academies and everything falls under one umbrella, uh, whereas you go to another rink and it'll be all separate, uh, separate entities. So it's a it, it's a way in which we're trying to ensure that we all work collectively so that the end product is the best it can be. So mm -hmm. if the coaches can be assisted by the coaching uh, mentors, i.e. Pete Wynn and Alan Mountry, we've already been in communication towards the tail end of last season. Uh, we've been with them, speaking with them during the summer to try to ensure that <clears throat> we are already or will be in the process of if something gets flagged up, because this team are seeming to be falling foul of these types of infractions we can then communicate that to the coaches section who are best placed to then speak to the coach for that club or academy and suggest another or different approach to how they may reduce what's happening on the ice in the same way that <clears throat> sometimes there there will be an incident whereby we'll look at it and say no there's no real communication this is that bad it needs to be dealt with and we're going to take mm -hmm. charge yeah. uh, in the same way as a referee would do during a game the game management works up to a point and the one thing that we've said and throughout same as when i used to referee there's a line in the sand and if you cross that line that's when you get suitable punishment and all we're trying to do is if we work as a joint collective hopefully the end product for the fans will be the best it can be Obviously, as you've highlighted, the national division has a group of owners and coaches whereby they're taking the next step, which is to fund things to try to get that better product. Whether the national teams below that or the senior teams below that wish to look at it and think to do something similar the season after. But yep, again, you know, happy days. It will benefit everybody at the end of the day. The question, of course, will immediately come from a lot of people of you're the governing body. Why aren't you funding it? <laughs> well, if there was an infinite pot of gold at the end of that, then, yeah, they would. But yeah. ultimately, the I think we can all agree here that within, you know, I've been involved in the sport since I was, sorry, I've been a part of the sport since I was eight years old. So that's coming up to 50 years soon. So. In all the time that I've been involved as a spectator, blah, 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 there's always been that imbalance in the sense that the top level has all the money and every, anything outside of that is make do. Now, even when the British Ice Hockey Association was around, um, they, they, they had a very similar approach about the funding goes primarily would go upstairs because that's what's that got the biggest attention so like heineken league etc back in the day yeah. um and i think you know it would be great to have a governing body that would have you know a good sponsor stuff like that that where money would be coming in but because you're not um so attractive shall we say to a sponsorship deal to come in because obviously if you look at it you know in terms of what scope have you got to push for me to come and have, uh, sponsor your league or your setup, 
the elite league has a bit of a you know shoe in the door in terms of exposure on the social media platform and the you know networks of tvs that can gain access to it and then obviously below that there's a bit more streamings coming online so teams are you know taking that next step but i think it'd have to be a collective group to try and sell everything because that means people would have to uh, be honest and upfront and say we may only get 700 people coming into our games however that's all 700 paying customers but on the streaming side we're getting 1200 people join on the stream so it would build a picture to the potential sponsor that oh this is quite good this then you know on the attendance day we only got seven they get 700 okay but on the streaming side they get in quite good figures in terms of it's a minority sport etc ken yeah um yeah it would it would have to be a collective i mean we haven't got the money to do it now. um uh personally um i know that we're all we're not fun we we don't get paid for this so there's there's not, no money changes hands um for us so i'm looking down the back of the sofa is what you're telling me everyone. exactly uh, but the, the clubs are notoriously skint anyway everybody is everything's tight at the moment and it would be lovely if we could do it um but it would be costly for the clubs uh so so there's only a finite amount of money coming into this boat at the moment you have to cut your cloth to to suit your funds and at some point it would be lovely actually it would be it would be, be a great idea if we could get it through the certainly the senior leagues um but again, one of, yeah one of the things that's occurred to me and this is this might be just off the back of um <clears throat> having having sort of la had last year kind of in the wilderness with Basingstoke not being around as you were and getting to see the setups of of different teams or anything like that is there a minimum standard of recording device for these games because certainly at times last year some of the videos that i was privy to uh, looked like they've been filmed in like they've been filmed in a potato um yes. trying to trying to trying to record charlie chaplin you know live in 19 1917 yeah kind of, uh, kind of thing now obviously the national division clubs they all have um, all 11 teams have streaming some teams in division one do even now we're seeing uh, the lee valley lions in uh, in south to are getting it but is there a minimum standard for this because one of the things that, uh, that occurs to me is that the conversation about docs always feels very very one way it's always at docs of you need to do better but ultimately any process like this with multiple member clubs involved multiple people involved you put in what you get out yes but what is the minimum standard here that a, that a club should be using for recording games because there isn't anything that immediately leaps out in the docs document to set anything out and actually if you're if people are wanting <coughs> things to be done properly then they need to have you know good footage of it doesn't look like it was shot on an extra sketch <laughs> i think i would i'd like to jump in straight away because when me and ken uh, went to the meeting during the summer yeah. Uh, I did ask the question about a minimum standard of video quality, etc., which I was advised that there was in their rules of competition, mm -hmm. etc. Because um, obviously we're in the same boat that when we get uh, the video feeds come into us, some of them are really good quality and some of them are very ropey, as you've said. Yeah, it's not. <clears throat> I would say, and I'm quite happy to say it here, that it's not Dops's position to say what you should be doing because ultimately it's going to cost money mm -hmm. so whilst um the league would be better positioned to recommend to their members that as we did say at the meeting in milton Keynes, it's in your best interest to have the best video quality available mm -hmm. so that's it i squarely put the owners back on the clubs and the teams because ultimately what they need to take into account is that it's for their benefit for the streaming uh, and then obviously if they wish to put in a, a video review request etc stuff like that if it's good quality it makes our job so much easier yes yeah it does so I I suppose, I would say the, issue the issue there of course is you are finding teams for not recording but then mm -hmm. will not give them any advice on how and uh, how you want that recording to be. I think a few certainly from my perspective that feels like a loop unclosed well we um, we are not in a play we are not in a position to do they're supposed to, to supply video at, to the standard that the league requires um, if they don't do it they get fined 
Um, the, the, the standard of the fine is set by the board. It's not set by us. It's just in our, um, in our um, uh, rules and procedures uh, so that the clubs can see it, what we, what we will be doing. I think but having said that, it's not really us that finds them. It's uh, this comes from the leagues. I think what to 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 back up what Ken's saying there is that sometimes uh, what we me and Ken have come to notice is the fact that uh, <clears throat> when you look at DOPS, there are certain sections that, as you've just highlighted about the fines, it's in the DOPS manual. However, it's nothing to do with DOPS in the sense of we have no input into it. It's not for us to make that decision. It's for the board stroke the league to set up and put into place and then go and deal with the deal, uh, getting the fines paid, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think why, why I would argue that it does fall under your remit, though, a little bit, because if this is about the Department of Player Safety and we're assessing illegal, dangerous hits, mm -hmm. why this is something that, aside from the fact that it doesn't make it clear in the document that you don't do anything with it, this surely falls under your remit because if you, it's about keeping players safe the ability to be able to look back on these things and keep players safe and use it as examples for coaches players referees at ihuk then actually this is something your foot should be firmly inside of i think it's something that could be looked at going forwards uh, yeah. and that's one of the things that we said throughout the summer is from the point of view that we're going to put stuff into place that we think is positive and proactive mm, yeah the proof of the pudding will become at the end of this season and then we'll be looking at stuff during the summer next time to see what worked what didn't work what we what can move forward mm. and i think what you're saying there um I, I personally because it's to do with monetary um and we try to avoid getting involved in that which is why the board is there and ihl management is there to to, to liaise with the clubs etc the funding that's available to each club, uh, what type of video software they should be doing. If you make a statement and say you have to do X, Y, Z, then you're putting an added cost onto some of the clubs, which rightly or wrongly is something that um, I think I'm probably happy to say me and Ken don't wish to get involved in. Mm -hmm. However, what we have done is we have said to everybody that we speak to, it's in your best interests to be able to provide the best quality and all we're saying to you is if you want to make a good case have good video quality and, and it's no different to the other vein of last season up to a point but i don't pay too much attention to it which is social media yeah in the same way that you get so you get good video quality from social media and then you get some really horrible stuff because the camera's shaking or oh, you get all the the person holding the camera so excited by what's going on it's like all over the place yeah, so um, nothing disciplinary procedures like an expressive laid and ran from the back of block six as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, I, yeah i appreciate now i appreciate it's a it is a there is a road to travel we're, we're edging towards the end of our time together uh, together okay. here though. so i will i will ask I will ask a slightly loaded question, but only because I'm unsure how I how I would answer it. So I need to ask you to. <laughs> how does, given where we've come from and the move away from the from the way discipline was done into last year of dots, which we've kind of acknowledged was uh, could have been done better in a in a variety oh, yeah. of ways. What does success look like when? the fine when 2024 25 comes to head but it's the end of coventry everybody's uh, everybody's in the respective hotel bars having the uh, having their last pint of the season what does success look like for the department of player safety in in this because mm -hmm. that because there's a lot of elements out of your control because with all the will in the world can't really control hockey players that well <laughs> but you are in control of a lot of things and you have a great deal of say in how clubs will approach things do things Dops has the potential to impact the season if a certain player is banned for a certain length of time for something that they do. What does success look like by the time the season ends? Well, for me, it's um, I, I, I'm kind of numbers guy, so I, I, I'm looking at the um, that what I did last season is looking at the number of dangerous issues that happen in the sport, especially the stuff that happens in play. So we're the big. Um, the big it's not fashionable but it's the, the big thing that's happening just now and it's happening in football it's happening in rugby it's happening in any contact sport it's concussions 
and brain injuries and so on. Um, so we looked at the numbers from last year. We, re we know that's a problem, and that's part of the thing that we've got to get out of the sport. We've got to get the high hit out of the game completely. The, the shot to the head is not acceptable under any circumstances and will be punished. Um, but we're, we're, we're in a situation where we would be looking at the numbers for that as well. Um, we know which clubs, we the, the numbers tell us which clubs have got a problem with that and we'll be dealing with them. We'll be not dealing with it, that's the wrong word, but we'll be working with them to get that eradicated and get it out of the sport completely. And success for me would be that we we don't we just we've stopped the that that particular issue happening we've stopped the check to the head we've stopped the the concussions and so forth that's the start for me um you alan for me i suppose I, I i'm looking at it with the referee's head on in some ways in the sense of there will be less talk about dots it'll be yes. what a great season nice. it was uh the finals were a great event it was well supported good turnout by the fan base there may be the occasional issue that arose because of a hit or this and you know i thought dops dealt with it okay um hopefully the number of complaints and issues raised that could go down it could go up because it's social media and uh, you know keyboard warriors and all that um you'll never appease everybody no you won't. Uh, and it's i sit comfortably in the knowledge that i've done everything that i can do to the best of my ability i did it as a referee people would always be unhappy uh, because you're there to make a decision and in this day and age any any person that has a job that deals with making a decision i tip my hat to you because it's in this day and age is extremely difficult to do well, we thank the two of you for being brave enough to step into the light. As I, as I did say, it is, uh, like I say, these, these conversations do not happen very often in public. So we do thank the two of you for, for being brave enough to do so. And I thank you for doing it here on uh, here with me on Banners on the Wall. For folks who haven't looked at it, in the description of this YouTube video will be the DOPS document. So you can go and have a read of it yourself, which will include all the fun things like the, the, the updated tariff system, the update about bans uh, that's, definitely, uh, that's definitely worth a read. And then we will see uh, we will see how it uh, how it goes. But as the 24-25 season is off and running, and you've already suspended one person, um, <laughs> clearly, the system, one. Clearly, the system, <laughs> clearly the system works works well enough where at least something uh, something happens. Ken Riddell, Alan Bachelor, thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you again. Good night.